Ramanujain is said to have said, said to have said, there are many quotes as, <laughs> which are attributed to Einstein, which are not necessarily found in his written works. But Einstein is said to have said that the caliber of a person is determined by the kind of questions they ask. At one level, we are always asking questions. Now, most of our questions are situational. Situational means that, okay, now you're sitting here. Okay, it's a little hot here. Maybe if I shift under the fan, it'll be a little more comfortable. Where can I get a backrest? Or, based on the situation, you come to a particular place, where is the car parking? So they are more functional questions. And these are at a practical level important to ask. And functional questions give functional answers. <coughs> at the same time, we humans are designed to ask bigger questions. A uh, few months ago, actually at the start of the year, I was in UK. So I was invited to Cambridge University to speak on science and spirituality. So we passed by the area where there is the tree where Newton is said to have seen the apple fall. Any of you know the story? Yes. Some people say the apple fell in front of him, some people say it fell on him. <laughs> <laughs> and when the apple fell on him, that's when Newton got a question. What was the question? Yeah, what made the apple fall, isn't it? Now imagine if instead of Newton, there had been a monkey sitting over there. <laughs> and the apple fell on the monkey. What would the apple have done? <laughs> no. <laughs> Who would have done what? Yeah, I asked what would the apple have done. <laughs> well, I would leave it, I'll leave it to you whether it was intentional or not. <laughs> so what would the monkey have done? Just eaten it. Now, that's a natural reaction. But, there is a deeper question that can be asked. That, okay, Newton asked, what made the apple fall? Most people would have asked, okay, this apple fell, okay, fine, let's eat it. But when he asked a deeper question, that's what led to him developing the principle of, uh, discovering the principle of gravity. So, that is again said to have started off the scientific revolution that led eventually to the development of the steam engine and so many other things. So basically, it's the question that was asked. And apples have been falling throughout history. But here there's a person who asked a question. So just as science is all about asking questions, but spirituality, especially as explained in the Vedanta Sutra and the broad Vedantic tradition, it is also about being curious, asking questions. Athato Brahma Jikyasa. So situational questions are what most people ask. Situational question is how to deal with the situation. And broadly speaking, the situational questions that we have, they fall in four broad categories. Mm -hmm. There are questions about food, they are questions about defense. The world can be a dangerous place. How do we protect ourselves? Mm -hmm. They are about reproduction. Mm -hmm. If human beings or any living being is to survive, then we need to reproduce. And then they are about, do you know the fourth thing? Shelter, rest. So, eating, sleeping, mating and defending. These are questions uh, about, questions about these are asked by everyone. And they are vital to ask. And we humans will also inevitably ask them. But we humans want to know something more. The answer to these questions give us means. Now we humans have come up with very sophisticated means. So food, we don't just wait for some fruit to fall to eat it. We have our own food production, food processing. We have food, pro food supply chains by which we get food. So the exact means in today's world are very sophisticated. But that's what the questions are in people's minds. 
most of the time. However, beyond these situational questions, there's another level of questions. That is existential questions. Now, existential, this word has two different meanings, which are almost opposite meanings. Existential can mean how to exist, or existential can mean why to exist. So how to exist also goes back to the more or less situational questions. But existential questions is what really matters? What makes existence worth living? For all of us, when we are going through life, we are pursuing means. So the answer to situational questions, it gives us means to deal with the situations. Okay, in the future, the economy might crash, so I've got some savings in the bank. That's a means. And means are important. But existential questions, their answer gives us meaning. It helps us make sense of things in our life, make sense of the world to whatever extent it is possible to make sense. Now, Arjun, in the Bhagavad Gita, had come with a set of situational questions and more or less answers prepared to those questions. He had come to the battlefield and when he had come to the battlefield, okay, if the enemy uses this strategy, we will use this strategy. If they do that, we will do this. That's a situational question. But when he was in the battlefield, there were two groups who were confronting each other. Does anyone know the name of the two groups? Yes, the Pandavas and the other were the Kauravas. Kauravas, yes. So now, the Kauravas were more or less on the good side. They were the good guys. They were trying to establish order in society. They had tried every means possible to settle the conflict peacefully. But the Kauravas, they were broadly speaking the bad side. The, in Star Wars terminology, they are the dark side. They are on the dark side. So now what happened is that they were just not ready to settle for peace. So Krishna himself had gone with a, for a peace proposal. But at that time, what happened? Does anyone know? Was the peace proposal accepted? No. Obviously, war is happening, so it's not accepted. <laughs> but why was it not accepted? Does anyone remember? Yeah. What happened? Uh, Krishna kept uh, lowering down what he wanted. Yes. And he lowered it to five villages. Um, and then uh, Duryodhan said, I won't even give uh, an area that a hero can pierce. Yes. And then he bound him in chains. And he? And then he bound him in chains. Yeah, he tried to bind him in chains. Right, right. He tried to bind him. He tried to have it arrested. I won't give you enough land to put even the tip of a needle through. If that had been the age of social media, this would have become a viral Insta reel. <laughs> what a dialogue! <laughs> but what does it mean in context? Now, when two parties are trying to have some peace, say Ukraine, America, Ukraine, uh, Russia, the war has been going on for a long time. So the top person from one side, say from Ukraine or from Russia, the top person, the premier goes to the other side to ask, to, to look for peace. And then such a reply comes, not even this much land. What it implies is something very, not just disrespectful, but downright humiliating. Suppose, say there is some ceremony or some program or some festival event at our home. And we invite someone to come. Now that person doesn't want to come. So they make an excuse. Now they are making an excuse. We know that they are making an excuse. And they know that we know that they are making an excuse. <laughs> but still, at least they are trying to make an excuse. If they say that even if I die, my dead body will never come for your program. Now what does that mean? They are not just refusing the invitation. They are basically kicking in the face of the inviter. So this was the rejection. So because of this, the war became inevitable. It's always good to try to settle things peacefully, 
but sometimes it's just impossible. So now, just before the war was about to happen, Arjuna on his chariot came in the middle. Arjuna was having Krishna as his charioteer. And since when he saw, okay, all these are my relatives. And then he started thinking, he got an existential question. What really counts? He says, is this kingdom worth this whole bloodshed? So many people will be killed. Is it worth it? And generally, existential questions are about, as I said, meaning. What really counts? What really matters? And we all get these questions sometime or the other. So, suppose we lose a loud one. And then, what, what really matters in life? That is the question can come. So this can come up in many different ways. But this question, when it comes up, that's when the entire spectrum of human experiences we have, if we consider which question, which kind of experience will trigger an ex existential question that varies from person to person. So, I grew up in India where India is a very education conscious country. And my sole ambition in life since my early childhood was academic excellence. I wanted to be first in my class. And I was always among the top students, but I was never the top. Many times I would come joint first, but never the first. And then finally I gave the GRE exam in my, when I was studying my engineering. So GRE is an exam which Indians give to do their post-grad studies in America. Post-grad, it's called post-grad in India, it's called grad in America. Basically, after your first, first years in university. So I always was quite good at English. And that's at the subject where many Indians struggle. So I did very well in the GRE exam. I came first, not just in my college. I came first in the history of my college. I was first at that time in the entire state of Maharashtra. And that's a state with, which I think about 10 million population or something like that. So now I was on the top, on top of the world, you know, Yahoo kind of thing. But then after some time, I realized that just looking at the mark sheet, doesn't give much happiness. So you know, okay, how long can you look at the mark sheet? Then it was when people congratulated me. That's when I felt some joy. And for some time I was a celebrity in my college. But somehow it happened that three of my friends, acquaintances, not very close friends, but they were friends, they forgot to congratulate me. It was not that they had any malice. It is just that, oh, everybody is talking about it, everybody knows about it. They just forgot. Now, when the first friend forgot to congratulate me, I was annoyed. Hmm? When the second friend forgot to congratulate me, I was irritated. What's going on? Why are you not congratulating me? And the third friend, it happened. By that time, I was enraged. Hmm? But I didn't want to seem pathetic. So I didn't ask them, why are you not congratulating me? <laughs> so, but at this point, say when I was in this situation, I almost had an out-of-body kind of experience. Where I felt as if I was looking at myself from above. And I felt, hey, wait a minute. Throughout your life, you believed that coming first is what will make you happy. And here you come first, but rather than being happy, you have become more dependent for your happiness on others. In the past, you could just have normal conversations with friends, but now you have become so needy. So is this really happiness? So that's the time I started getting this question, what really matters? What will make life meaningful? 
So meaningful, I meant here, what was it that would give me satisfaction, which would be intrinsic? Here there was some satisfaction when others congratulated me, but that was extrinsic satisfaction. That is the time when I started reading the Bhagavad Gita. And in the Bhagavad Gita, I came across this verse 622. It is a verse about spiritual, spiritual realization, a state of spiritual realization. It's spiritual state which is called Samadhi. And what it describes is if you attain this state, then yam labdhva chaparam labham manyate nadhikam tataha. Once you attain this, you will not crave for anything more. And secondly, yasmin sthitona dukkhena gurunapi vichalyate. That having attained this, you will not lament, you will not be disturbed. So it's generally, there will be no more craving and no more lamenting. No more fretting, fuming, resenting, whining, all that. So I looked ahead at my life and I thought, what can I achieve? Maybe I, I was all set to go to America. At that time, I, my, I had a maternal uncle who had his own company and he didn't have any son to be his successor. So he wanted me to come there. And I said, okay, I might go there or I might uh, take, I might inherit that company or I might become a scientist and write published papers or whatever. So is there any achievement on the horizon for me which will provide me freedom from craving and freedom from lamenting? He said, there's nothing. And that's when I felt that this, this inner state, the spiritual realization, this is what is the most worthwhile achievement. And this does not require that one renounce the world and go towards a, a, some Himalayan, some mountain top or something like that. But it just means that we keep our focus inward. We work outward, but our focus is primarily on inner growth. So that is existential questions. What really matters in life? So the functional questions or the situational questions are obviously important. Making money is important. But what we are making with money is even more important. A money is basically means. But what we do with money is what brings meaning. Otherwise, a person can have a lot of money and they may buy a huge house. But in buying that house or getting to that financial position, they maybe have no time for their family, no time for friends. Maybe they have to backstab their, some of their friends to rise on top. And then the huge house, all that it gives them is a lot of space in which to be lonely and unhappy. So unless we ask this existential question, our life won't have any fulfillment for us. And it's significant among the youth across the world. So nowadays the Zoomers, Zoomers is those who constantly use Zoom. <laughs> so, there is an increasing emphasis on post-material values. Post-material values means that maybe 20, 30 years ago, 40, 50 years ago, most people, their concern was, okay, how can I get a job which will give me a lot of money, a lot of comforts. In America, it's called the Great American Dream. You have your house with a picket, picket fence and a nice uh, scenery around it. That's okay. But the point is that nowadays people are concerned more with what can I do that will bring meaning to my life? What is it that is meaningful to me? Now, meaning does not have to be something abstract alone. Okay, it's not just a philosophical sense of meaning. Generally, meaning comes, it simply comes by taking responsibility to add value. To add value, not just to ourselves, but to others. Can I do something 
does my existence matter to someone else? Mm -hmm. In nursing homes, I mean, many nursing homes and people say are living all alone, their family is not there anymore. And now many times people just sink into old age and then they die. So in nursing homes they found that if you just told the old person that, you know, it is your responsibility to take care of this plant. That plant is inconspicuous. But just that small responsibility, one plant, it is your responsibility to water it. Those who were given this, on an average, the specifics vary across the world, but those who took responsibility to take care of one plant, they lived, with other conditions being similar, between one and a half years to almost ten years more than others. So just having something that we add value to others. In youth, naturally, our hormones are active and we, have, we want to explore, we want to enjoy. That's natural. But while we are doing that, it is actually the meaning. How does my existence add value to something beyond me? It's not just my pleasure, but it's my contribution to something beyond me. And that is the question that Arjuna has. I'm fighting this war for what? If it's just for a kingdom, is it really worth all this? So that is the question that the Gita answers. And the Gita says that you are, that each one of us is a part of God. And it's not just that we alone are struggling to find some meaning in a meaningless world. Or we are trying to add value to a world where everything will be made valueless in future. No. Each one of us has value to offer by a divine plan. And the more we turn inward to understand ourselves. Basically, to answer existential questions. The Gita talks about three broad steps. First is, we look upward. We understand that each one of us has intrinsic value. That some of us you know, may be more good looking than others. Some of us may feel I am not as smart as that person. I am not as fluent in my speech as the other person. I am not as good at sports. These are all extrinsic factors. Some of us have more talents than others. But if we look upward and we understand that Mamai Vam Show Jeeva Loke each one of us is a precious part of the divine. And that's why each one of us has intrinsic value. And then we look inward. When we look inward, that is the time we find what is what are the gifts that we have. So those could be our talents, those could be our interests. Sometimes people say, I want, to, oh, I want to find my passion in life. It's good if you can find a passion. But instead of waiting for one particular day, and suddenly some lightning bolt will hit us and we'll know this is the passion of my life. We just begin with curiosity. Okay, what interests me? So in general, if we look at our talents and interests, there are two things over here. What are the things we feel good doing and then what are the things that we are good doing now feel good doing doesn't mean oh I just like to party and watch comedy shows no there's something meaningful that we do oh I like art I like music I like math I like computers what do we feel good doing and then what is it that we are good at doing and if you can find the intersection of these two then that is likely the area where we can find what is it of value that we can provide. And then after that, to answer the existential question, we look outward. Outward means that, okay, in the situation I am in, given the gifts that I have, how can I contribute? Unfortunately, most of us keep looking outward alone and then we never really find out what we have. Because in the world always some things will be glamorized. And if we feel I don't have that, then we'll always feel insecure. And especially now in social media, 
what happens is everybody puts the best moments of their life on social media. And then we compare our, our real life with others often selected or even doctored picture of life. And I think, oh, this person went there and they enjoyed so much and I'm not enjoying at all. This person like this, this person like that. So if we keep looking outward, we will never find ourselves. So look upward, have the confidence that God has a plan for our life. There is something we can contribute. Then look inward to find out what are the gifts that we have. And then look outward to see how we can be of service. How we can make a contribution in the situation that we have. So basically Arjuna is guided in this. Krishna tells Arjuna that ultimately this war is being fought by a higher plan. You may think you are fighting to get even, to get a kingdom, but that's not the purpose of the war. The purpose of the war is to establish order in human society. Those who are exploiters and abusers and tyrants, they have to be neutralized. And that's why this war is being fought. And you have the talent, the talent of an archer. You have the disposition of an archer. And outward, now you fight. But fight in a mood of service and contribution, not in a mood of possession and control. And with that vision, when he fights, that is where he becomes by the end of the Bhagavad Gita confident, with his bow raised. So existential questions help us find meaning in our life. And then, what is the last in the acronym which we are discussing? T is transcendental questions. Now, transcendental questions are about once we understand that it is the ultimate reality, which is known by the name Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita, that ultimate reality is the highest reality. That ultimate reality is the supreme object of love. Then we want to know more and more about Krishna. And it is in knowing and loving Krishna, knowing and loving and serving Krishna, that there is, there is, you could say, endless joy. These questions, many times when people come to a temple, they are asking God, Mm. Okay, please fulfill this prayer, please fulfill that prayer. So for many, uh, many people, God is like a vending machine. You know, I put in a prayer and then I get the desire fulfilled. Well, okay, that's one way of looking at God. But God is not just the fulfiller of our desires. He is also the fulfillment of our desires. He is all attractive and in knowing Him, loving Him, in singing about Him, the kirtans that we were participating in before. There is great joy. So when we want to know about Krishna more and more, so Krishna, basically, we can see him as the fulfiller of desires. And that is more or less transaction. Okay, I have this desire. I worship God. My desire is fulfilled. Okay, good. So that's one way of approaching. Once a person came to a temple and he said, Oh God, I purchased this lottery. It's worth a million dollars. So, if I win this lottery, I'll give you half. Okay, so the lottery was going to give the result after a week. And then, when the day result came out, he found that his number was the winner. He was elated. Till he noticed that he had actually won the second prize. So, the first prize was one million, second prize was half a million. So, then he went to a temple and he said, Oh God, you are so clever, you took your share first only. <laughs> so, the idea is that when we see God simply as a fulfill of desires, it's a transaction, it's a business relationship. In a business relationship, generally we try to give as less as possible and get as much as possible. But the more complete vision is, He is the fulfillment of desires. That not so much one particular desire or another particular desire, just in loving God, remembering God, serving God, in loving, in, in Krishna, our heart finds the highest fulfillment. Vasudeva Sarvamiti. And knowing about Krishna, that is, all transcendental questions. So Krishna, Arjuna in the 10th chapter, he asks, 
ವಿಸ್ತರೇಣ ಆತ್ಮನೋ ಯೋಗಂ ವಿಭೂತಿಂ ಚ ಜನಾರ್ದನ ಭೂಯ ಕಥೆಯ ತೃಪ್ತಿರಿ ಶೃಣ್ವತೋ ನಾಸ್ತಿ ಮೇ ಅಮೃತ ಐ ನೆವರ್ ಗೆಟ್ ಟೈರ್ಡ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಹಿಯರಿಂಗ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಯು ಪ್ಲೀಸ್ ಟೆಲ್ ಮಿ ಮೋರ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ದ ಹೋಲ್ ಶ್ರೀಮದ್ ಭಾಗವತಂ ಇಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಕ್ವೆ ಇಸ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಅಬೌಟ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಇಸ್ ಅ ಟ್ರಾನ್ಸೆಂಡಲ್ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ಮೀನ್ಸ್ ವನ್ಸ್ ವಿ ಹವ್ ಅಂಡರ್ಸ್ಟುಡ್ ಇಟ್ ಇಸ್ ಇನ್ ಕನೆಕ್ಟಿಂಗ್ ವಿತ್ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಕಾಂಟ್ರಿಬ್ಯೂಟಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಇನ್ ಅ ಮೂಡ್ ಆಫ್ ಸರ್ವಿಸ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ ಇಸ್ ದ ಸೋರ್ಸ್ ಆಫ್ ಮೀನಿಂಗ್ ದೆನ್ ವಿ ಗೋ ಬಿಯಾಂಡ್ ಮೀನಿಂಗ್ ಟು ಫುಲ್ಫಿಲ್ಮೆಂಟ್ ಟು ಅನ್ಲಿಮಿಟೆಡ್ ಜಾಯ್ ಸೊ ದೀಸ್ ಆರ್ ದ ಕ್ವೆಶನ್ಸ್ ದ್ಯಾಟ್ this the transcendental questions are they bring not just meaning but they bring joy and ecstasy in our life so this is how we all can progress in the level of questions that we ask and the responses that we get this is the journey the bhagavad gita invites each one of us to go on so i'll summarize i spoke three main points today okay what was the acronym does anyone remember said thank you so the this was basically about elevating the topic was elevating the questions that we ask so the first kind of questions are what situational life puts us in various kinds of situations and we have to deal with those situations so those could be circumstantial okay where can i get some drinking water where is a comfortable place during this heat those are questions around our situations they broadly fall in the categories of related with food and reproduction and uh, things like that and defense and shelter so they are these are you could say practical questions practical or functional questions and they are important but we humans are not satisfied just by those answers these can provide us means and through technology these means can become very sophisticated but we want something more what is second level existential questions so these are about not just how can i get better means but how can i get greater meaning how can my existence bring value and this is vital for us so science progresses by this that what what made this happen i want to understand this better what is the meaning of this and spirituality is not just at least the way the bhagavad gita presents it it is not about simply believing it is about or inquiring it is about have curiosity ask bigger deeper questions it's also asking some question <laughs> <laughs> and the gita offers us a pathway how we can a three step method by which we can f- bring value so meaning is not an abstract thing meaning comes to the extent we take the responsibility to bring value through our life to others and for that the three step is look upward to know that god exists and god has a purpose for our life then what a second thing inward look inward to see what are the gifts that we have you can try to find what we are good doing what we feel good doing find the intersection of that and the third is then look outward to see in the particular situation that i am in how can i make a contribution how can i act in the mood of service and then that brought us so that's how our existence can start having more and more value and the last kind of questions are transcendental, transcendental questions so these are about the transcendental reality krishna not just how krishna can fulfill my desires but who krishna is and knowing about him serving him loving him this takes us beyond meaning further to fulfillment to joy to ecstasy so the gita guides each one of us on this journey to deeper questions better and richer answers thank you very much hare krishna hare krishna so is there any question about questions Yes, please, Prabhu. Okay. Uh, the question says, so then I want to know, oh, check against all the sinful reactions do not be, but people don't even know Krishna, what to speak to surrender to him. So how, how do we preach to non-believers? Yes, so, well, surrender to Krishna is the concluding instruction. And Krishna himself says that part of the Gita is don't speak this to everyone. It's very advanced. He says that, what we need to start with is 
where people are at. See, Shila Prabhupada also explains that realization, he says, whenever we are trying to speak with, about Krishna, we should speak with realization. And he tells what is realization. He says, if we consider this is the message of the Gita, message of scripture in general. Hmm. It's, realization means to not screw out any unscrupulous meaning from scripture. But at the same time, to present it in a way that is interesting to the audience. So we look at the message of scripture and then we look at what are the interests of people. And now we say people's interests, people are interested in movies and sports and this and that, that's there. But that's not all that they're interested in. There are, say for example in today's world, a lot of people are having mental health concerns. The mind troubles almost everyone. And the Bhagavad Gita has a lot of wisdom on the mind. So, it is our responsibility to first study scripture and then to study the audience that we are speaking to. To understand what would be of interest to them. And then find the area of intersection. So I find the mind and how to manage the mind is actually of great interest to people. So in general, if we talk about say how you are not your body, people find that quite abstract and irrelevant. But if you explain, you are not your mind. Oh really? Explain more to me. Now if you actually explain it, the Gita has a three level model of the self. It's like there is the body, that is our physical side. There is the mind, our mental side, and beyond that is the soul, which is the essence of who we are. So it's like in computer you may have a hardware, software, and user. So we are the user. So once we understand this, then we understand, uh, yeah, my mind is like my software. It may, it may be a little corrupted, but I am different from it. So explaining how we are different from the mind is something which is extremely relevant for people. So I have written a few books. The latest book I wrote. Do we have copies here? Okay. So it's You Are Not Your Mind. So that's one of the latest books. But basically, if you observe people, we'll find that there are people, there are areas of interest. So for example, Vishla Prabhupada talked about simple living and high thinking. Now he talked about farms. Now that may not be of a direct interest to people, but the underlying principle is that it's ecological sustainability. And that is of great interest to people today. So that way we can find out. We don't just want to preach our philosophy. We also want to address the needs of people, including their felt needs. So when we do that, that's the expertise. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Any other questions? Yes, please. The fulfiller of desires means that I have this desire, I pray to Krishna and fulfill, I, that desire is fulfilled. That's fulfiller of desires. And that's true enough. Krishna can do that for us. But fulfillment of desires means that when Krishna's presence manifests in our heart, then that presence itself is so enriching. That's why the movement that Srila Prabhupada started is called International Society for Krishna Consciousness. Prabhupada wanted our consciousness to be enriched with Krishna's presence. And when Krishna is present in our consciousness as the central object, as the key, key center of our life, all our activities are related with Krishna in a mood of service, then that presence of Krishna itself becomes enriching for us. That There are great saints who may have a lot or who may have nothing. But because they have Krishna in their hearts, they are completely satisfied. That's the meaning of Krishna is the fulfillment of desires. We know Arjuna himself, he could have chosen an entire army. But he chose Krishna. Because he knew Krishna is, Krishna is the supreme value.
ओके गुड गुड क्वेश्चन एंड इट्स अ गुड सिचुएशनल क्वेश्चन अबाउट एग्जिस्टेंशियल क्वेश्चन सी जनरली वेन आवर सिचुएशन इज अनस्टेबल then naturally situational questions will become more mm-hmm. say for example if i'm traveling if i'm driving and i don't know where i'm going to eat food and i'm already hungry and is there a restaurant there is there some arrangement by which i can buy something or do something then food will become prominent in my consciousness so generally if the situation is unstable then situational questions become more prominent so overall our effort in life should be to try to create as stable a situation as possible ultimately life cannot have a completely stable situation there will always be some level of uncertainty but overall if we get our situation settled to some extent then it is easier to focus on existential questions but having so especially if you go say teenage it's the age of transition that is the age when say one is actually discovering oneself one's own identity who i am how do i fit in the world so naturally at that time situational questions could be more but that doesn't mean existential questions have to be completely rejected so i won't call it faking it because the word fake has a fake sense to it but it's more that it's a intentional action intentional means with intention i do something say if somebody wants to become fit then they decide that every day i'm going to exercise now they may not feel like exercising but they still get up and maybe they go for a run they go for a walk whatever it is now they don't feel like it but they're doing it are they faking it no basically that's the discipline discipline means to put our intention above our emotion So this is not we this is greater than so to put our intention above our emotion that is the essence of discipline so i it is not so much faking as cultivating discipline so i know existential questions are important so even if those questions don't pop up in my mind automatically still if i hang out with people who do deliberate on these questions then gradually those questions will also come in my mind and they will also grow yes to association and discipline both so th- thank you yes well uh, maybe i think all of you have to take food also last question yes for you you have a question uh, yes. can come back to you yeah um i was asking what the distinction between our soul and our consciousness is okay that's a good question see the soul mm, the soul is the source of consciousness so consciousness is like the energy coming from the soul and the mind and the body are mediums by which consciousness comes out so when somebody is absent minded and basically what happens is their consciousness is getting dissipated it is getting fragmented between their body and their mind that means say the consciousness is coming out as a energy but if they are very absent minded that means most of their consciousness is going in their mind and maybe their mind is maybe maybe is thinking of some cricket match that is going to start and what is the score over there or thinking of something else some movie some video game and then a little consciousness is over here so that's why sometimes we're talking with someone and we see that person's eyes are glazed earth to you earth to you come back which planet have you gone to is it it so a little consciousness they come back so generally con- so consciousness is the energy of the soul so if i have a phone and say this phone has a flashlight so now the 
the flashlight itself this is the soul and then the light coming from it is consciousness and say the mind is over here so when the mind is open you could say the consciousness and the energy comes out when the mind is closed or distracted then the consciousness goes elsewhere so the the soul is the root of consciousness and the mind is the root of consciousness is the root and this is the you could say use the word route route of consciousness the pathway for consciousness soul mind body and consciousness okay yes. thank you good question any, any last question yes can we talk one to one afterwards yeah, yeah. please um, so so the question tells us you know all this stuff i don't chat with us and he says give up all your eyes and religion so he was he saying give up all dharma and just remember what to make so is he saying reject all the everything that i've discussed with you or is he saying materialistic religion Okay. So, what does Sarva Dharma and Paritajya mean? And give up all dharma. Well, the word dharma has many different meanings. One of them is religion, another is duty. So, it's like a patient who is consulting with a doctor. The patient has a serious disease, and the doctor gives various options. You can go for natural, if you have cancer, you can go for chemotherapy, radiotherapy, you can just have less intervention, take, take, take some tablets, do this, do this. And now, like that, Arjuna is lost, is undecisive, and Krishna is giving him various options, various yoga paths, various dharmas, various duties. Now, at the end of it, Krishna tells, just three verses before 1866, 1863 says, Now you deliberate and do as you desire. Vimrishaita but then Arjuna goes deep into thought. You know, Krishna has spoken so many things in so many places. What does Krishna really want me to do? So it's like a doctor gives all the options and says, now you decide what you want to do. But then the patient thinks, okay, what is the doctor actually recommending? Then if the patient asks, doctor, if this had been your own child who had a cancer like this, or your loved one had this cancer, what would you recommend? Now that is the time when the doctor will not just be like a dispassionate informer. Doctor will be a much more involved guide. Invested guide, you could say. So that is Krishna in 1866. She says, if you really want to know what I would like you to do, I have told you many things, but this is what I want you to do. Sarva dharman ekam sharanam So now he also says that bhūyaha, Bhuya means again. I am speaking this highest message again. So when the doctor has given various options, in which, in among those options, the doctor has also given the recommended option. But now, that recommended op option is coming with an unambiguous emphasis. So like that, the recommended option that Krishna is giving is with an unambiguous emphasis. Maam ekam sharanam raja. So that's what Krishna is saying, that if you really want to know what I want you to do, then that is surrender to me. So yes, it doesn't refer to religion as we understand the word today. We consider Islam, Christianity, these religions were not there when Krishna spoke the Bhagavad Gita. So there the word dharma refers to various conceptions of duty, various conceptions of what is the right thing to do. So is it the right thing, the best thing for you to do is to harmonize with my will. Okay. So thank you very much for your thoughtful questions and participation. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.